Coming up in this episode of Bitcoin for Millennials. As all transactions these days are happening digitally, so on a database somewhere, you know, <laughs> this is the attack factor. And yeah. that's also in a broader game theoretical uh, perspective, that's where you see this play out, right? So you have this super tiny bank in the Netherlands. Where are the databases? Probably some foreign power knows where these databases are. So if they drop these three bombs where they have these databases, the entire bank is gone. Yeah. And this is something that is not in anyone's yes, mind, yes, right? Yes, yes, so yes. It's, it, this is so scary also from my perspective. So for me, like Bitcoin, which is like everything is nuked, it will still run, you know? Like it's just like such a solid digital monetary database that will always work no matter what happens across the globe. And I can't say that for any other monetary system. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Bert de Groot. He's an engineer by trade who keeps greenhouses, warehouses and offices warm with the Bitcoin miners he sets up. Bert has also helped thousands of businesses, families and plebs on their Bitcoin journey with his company BitcoinBrabant.com as an official reseller of open source hardware wallets, Dutch Bitcoin books, workshops and much more. He enjoys working on the Bitcoin standard full time and is currently also the chairman of VBNL.org, a body of 13 Dutch Bitcoin companies that work together in this industry to combat fraud and improve Bitcoin adoption in the Netherlands. Bert is one of the most helpful, friendly, fr friendliest and humble Bitcoiners I know. So I'm excited to talk with him today. So uh, welcome, Bert. Thank you for the friendliest part. That's, uh... Yes, <laughs> definitely. And I hope I can stay humble in this. Uh in this podcast because uh, the price is, is nice eh, in, in, in euro terms. And uh, I think a lot of people are becoming uh, a little bit less humble. And uh, I think that's one of the, the most difficult parts for, uh, for some. Yeah. Well, at one point, I think we all want to say, I, I told you so. Um, but I generally view that as almost like an altruistic uh, thing, right? Because uh, you hopefully trigger someone to actually start listening to you, you know, like when we have all these attempts at helping people like studying this. And uh, yeah, at one point, it's just going to run away from them, you know? Yeah, but I think uh, I told you so far, it doesn't really help adoption, right? So uh, that's this, is, this is the, the, the difficult part. Because you can be right, and uh, a lot of people before us, because we are latecomers, eh, both of us. So uh, uh, I think that makes it uh, really complex because the I told you so will not onboard anyone. It will uh, just keep more and more people away because there's the lucky guys. So uh, I think in that sense, that this is uh, already like directly a very super interesting topic of uh, the educational part that you have been through throughout the years, that's not something that other people see. They just think you drop some money in and you got rich or something, if that's the case, you know, like and for us, maybe not as much as for others. But I think that's uh, one of the prime things that, that should not be like the I told you so part or the, the, the generic uh, stream of, uh, of information that you want to get across people because that's not that's not nice, you know? Yeah. It helps everyone. And that's what it's really about. And it doesn't matter when you actually start to do something with Bitcoin. It's just you you want to at some point because it's better for you. Yeah. And that's not the I told you so part. So yeah. I, I would I would agree. I, I'm not sure if I would actually say i told you so out loud but i, I will definitely think it but i i mean i i 100 agree with you because i don't know about you but i cannot really retrace my own steps anymore from like you know discovering it 10 years ago then like up and down with interest up and down with spending time you know and then eventually you know something clicks and then you're like all into it but i i could not retrace my own steps or where i was really like okay i'm i'm swapping one belief or understanding for another and now this is you know how how my view changes so yeah yeah, yeah in that sense i i had also like a lot of touch points and i understand correctly that there was some shit coining in the past for you oh 100% yeah 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 so 
that's a part I never touched. So for me, it was really that in a company I was working, uh, an, an engineering firm in Delft, where a lot of colleagues were already uh, interested and in investing in Bitcoin. I had a local friend here from this small town where I'm from that started to mine in 2014. I still have the app that he sent me like, Bert, you want to join in because we're going to mine Bitcoin? Oh, cool. Like uh, so many touch points, but uh, you can also see my replies, you know, back in 2014, I said, this is never going to work. The Chinese have free electricity. They have unlimited uh, capacity with building out computers. Like they will have like 99% of the network. And at some point they will just take over and entire Bitcoin will be gone. And I've held this standpoint for until 2019, let's say, until I, you know, like started to investigate it a bit deeper. And then I spent, yeah, the 10,000 hour rule. So for me, it was like I had a lot of touch points through time. And because I also worked in, yeah, let's say the software, <laughs> um, I was very hesitant also technically to to really dive in. And I think, We've now come to a point that it's very, 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 very hard to 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 stop. Um, mm -hmm. And that point actually came not that long ago for me, also. So uh, the investigation part, and then also physically, yeah, we were just discussing Umbrel. <laughs> you know, the the interesting thing is like once you've set up the node you've done all the hardware you've done all the the, the code checking whatever you can do i'm not a coder in that sense so but whatever i i'm capable of checking i would like to also verify and then you jump into the mining part and then yeah an, another box opens which is super interesting but you also see some risk there so again you want to 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 jump into that more deeply and really make sure that everything you think that is the case will also be perpetual, you know, like it, it's really long-term. So the next 100, 200, 300 years, we know for sure that this system is capable of working uh, and I'm willing to invest all my time and energy in this. Yeah. And that's for me really something that, that became apparent in 2021 uh, when I started Bitcoin Brabant. So it's a journey and for everyone is different but uh, yeah I've, in that sense i've been really late so i need to do more proof of work to actually survive on a bitcoin standard so. hey there i want to ask you for a quick favor i noticed something interesting 75 percent of my viewers aren't subscribed yet subscribing helps me grow this channel ensuring more great content each week so if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. Well, yeah. I, I think I think late as in uh, as in when it clicked. But I I think this is a great example, right? Like like I just said, like my journey was 2013. Got totally into it, like trading, etc. Then I kind of lost interest. Then uh, I sold a startup at one point, and I sold it for ETH at like I don't know 180 dollars or, or or something. Um, and then I got into the ICO stuff, the shitcoin stuff, of course. But but really from a perspective of I, I always knew that like new technology is a wild west, so I knew it was a wild west. Um, so I didn't go too. I like I tried it out, but I, I didn't lose too much money, luck, <laughs> luckily. Um, but what is funny is that uh, a few weeks ago I looked up my old tweets from 2013 when I was like, "Oh, Bitcoin uh, crashed back to a hundred dollars. Should I buy more?" You know, and I and I I. I, I also tweeted about you know bitcoin is like a digital commodity you can't print or something like like similar tweets and i was like damn i got it right like i i understood it but no i didn't you yeah know? so exactly. it's just it's just one one angle but not not in the bigger picture and i think that yeah. is also why it's so hard to understand because in in essence bitcoin is fairly simple yeah but it's not easy to understand. It's very hard to understand because it touches yeah. all these dimensions in in the world that that 
we think we know, right? And I uh, actually I, I tweeted a, um, an article today from Jesse Myers about um, why the the, the yuppies uh, hate uh, <laughs> hate Bitcoin, and he said, you know, these are the intelligent people that trust systems. They they are in their ivory tower and they think that the ivory tower is a representation of the world and that they know everything. And if something comes along that they don't know about, right? That's also the meme, right? Like uh, I'm a PhD. Uh, I don't know anything. I didn't study Bitcoin, but you're wrong. <laughs> you know, I guess yeah. the meme. Um, like it's it's it, it's so it's spot on because it's that feeling. Yeah. Like uh, you have a fake trust in yourself. You know, yeah. and and once you study Bitcoin and reflect, then you can actually trust yourself. And that's yeah. actually what I like so much. Like even for you, eh, you've started really early in the game, but still you didn't really grasp Bitcoin. And then the the risks of Bitcoin along the way were still relatively high. So if you talk to the OGs, you know, it's really like, yeah, oh, I bought a, a new bicycle for eight hundred Bitcoin. Oh man, what did I do? You know, I did, I never understood <laughs> yeah. it. And, and then you know, I I I also know some miners. You know, more than ten years in the game and. They're just like, yeah, man, and uh, we were trading shit coins a lot. And I said, like, what would have happened if you would just have held your Bitcoin? You know, like, yeah. you would have, yeah, I wouldn't have been doing the mining still. You know, like, <laughs> so it, that's basically the path. You know, like for for ninety nine percent of the people you also meet that actually have grasped it earlier, they always exchange it for something that they needed along the way or. They try to make more of it. You know, yeah. you have like also these trading companies. They say, yeah, we have a really great return of investment in fiat terms, but we never outperform Bitcoin. But no. at least our customers are happy, right? Yeah. So <laughs> th this is yeah, this is sure. really in the industry. It's a super interesting dynamic because, yeah, the Bitcoin by itself, like also what I'm doing with, with this little company, you know, helping people, it, it, it basically, you constantly lose Bitcoin. So if you look, for instance, we did uh, a lot of Blockstream Jades, eh? so hundreds and hundreds of them for Europe. And then at some point I bought, like, let's say, yeah, I think I bought one batch of 200 in one go. And that was when the price was around 18,000, 19,000 euros. And then, of course, when the price propels up, you just lose Bitcoin yeah, with no every profit. sale you make yeah. because, <laughs> you know, it's in Bitcoin terms. And I think in Bitcoin. So, like, the the business you know, is is profitable in fiat terms, but it's insanely bad in Bitcoin terms. Yeah. So this is always like, how do you outperform Bitcoin? Yeah, if you have, if you want to have a business, it's almost impossible. I I don't see an easy way to do that. Like on in an honest way, let's say of course you have all these scammers and these Yeah. Th that's a different story, but in an honest way, I I I I think it's very very difficult. Yeah, yeah. I have similar. I I bought at four hundred, sold everything at four thousand. I've bought yeah. headphones that are now like seven thousand <laughs> or ten thousand euros. And they, I hope they, they are still the same. The ones no, you they have broke on. within a year. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's it's. Uh, I have less Bitcoin than I had when I when I bought it at four hundred. You know, but but I think that's part of it. You know, I mean, I got scammed in the shitcoin stuff like. That. But, but you know the the only thing you can un uh, the only way you can understand it is to to like try it out and be there right like i i um i had an interview for for like a little docu series and the interviewer uh, i was talking to her uh we're going to have lunch because i think she's almost there actually <laughs> but it's funny and she told me like what i don't like about bitcoiners is that sometimes when people have like a critique they say like you didn't study enough i said i'm sorry but it's true you know because from the argument you can yeah. hear that they just they, they don't even have bitcoin they did never they never created a wallet or even an exchange account or what whatever right and so you know you say 10,000 hours i think yeah. i have the same i don't know more like, yeah, like how are you coming at me with like 1 hours of uh, of 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 write, uh, you know reading blog posts or whatever like what are you talking about you know and i think you have to be real about that. Like, I'm not going to talk about uh, what a surgeon is doing, you know, because I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 This is really like something I, I, I really love in, in, in that sense in my new job, right? So uh, as a chairman of the United Bitcoin companies in the Netherlands, I also get to go to very nice meetings where uh, the banks are also present. And then I have to present a little bit about Bitcoin because they wanted to know a bit more about it. And then you have like the chairman there. He's 
now retiring so uh good luck and uh, enjoy but uh <laughs> the nice thing is like he, he he's like the, the chairman of this payment platform and i asked him like it was the last meeting physical meeting and i asked him did you ever actually receive any bitcoin or do no 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 i don't know anything about this i said grab your phone man you know install this app and i'll i'll put some sats on it you know and i did that and he was like yeah nobody ever did this you know like I didn't exactly. know it was this easy, you know, and I don't have yeah. to show my passport. What what's it what is this? You know, like this is Yeah. Yeah. This is where it's all about, right? There are billions of people who don't have a passport and they actually want to exchange something without it being like some kind of note with a dictator hat on it, you know, that's maybe something that we want to have in this planet. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, maybe then it clicks, right? So it's it's really nice when you don't have any touch points, and especially in the Netherlands where you know the the payment system is is really really great. So uh, you're you're so far out, you know, mm -hmm. from where it is across the globe. And because I worked a lot across the globe, you see the necessity uh, so much more than other people. Because yeah, I've been working with so many people from different layers and different places of of this planet that this is really necessary. And we actually can build quite a lot of infrastructure here that will help all these people in the authoritarian uh, sides of our planet. So it's super nice that as soon as that clicks and also the impact that it can have, that, yeah, that people start to open up. And I think that's something that's really still missing, like on the ed educational part, that most people always look at it from like the personal gain, but it's... I, I've always learned like you can only have a good life if the people around you also have a good life because if the people around you, uh, their life sucks and they have to basically steal their life uh, away. Eh? So uh, that will also affect you. And, and then you see these differences in different locations of our planet, you know, where you have to put more protection up because people can actually take stuff yeah. from you and will take stuff from you because the differences are much greater and it's like not a fair system and i think and that's also what what's coming back so next week i'm i'm going to the the parliament i have a discussion there with a couple of people in the parliament in the netherlands and we have always been a trading nation and why have we been such a stable trading nation it's because we had such a stable currency you know we had a very very stable uh, very very conservative currency which uh, basically was even better than the dollar if you look in the past. So uh, a link to the De Deutsche Mark. So this is something where stability is is, is a big part of, of yeah, ingrained in us, you know, like as the Dutch people. So And we let that go now under the euro. So what do we want to do? You know, like also the, in politics, where, where do we want to move to? Do we, do we want to go back into this more conservative approach of holding a stable currency? And actually, the countries that will do this will be like the biggest enemy of Bitcoin in that sense. Because if they can show that they have a very conservative currency there, which works perfectly well on the centralized database and is super efficient, and you can relatively trust them well, that will be used by a lot of people on this planet. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where in the long term, you know, the competition is going to come from. And the yeah. question is, which countries will move first, right? So, yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because uh, I haven't seen any proof of it, but I think people are talking about how, like, the petrodollar ended, like, yesterday or something. I, oh, yeah, with the Saudi Arabia uh, I don't, I don't deal. know. I don't yeah. know. There's nothing public about it. But in general, you know, this is what, what you're sharing is what the BRICS are going to try to do, right? And it's interesting that... It's happening in general, and I agree with you. If you, if you, because they will never, well, never say never, but, but you know, the incentive for them currently is to not move to a decentralized currency, obviously, right? So they're doing it in a centralized way, but by creating a currency based on uh, or creating a basket, you know, of, of their currencies, of course. Well, it, it's this is the end game, right? More stable than yeah. the US dollar, right? Well, this, this is the end yeah. game, right? Like, if, yeah. if you just, and actually, if anybody watches uh, us, check the documentary by uh, Smith, which is called Bitter Lake. 
which is about the petrodollar and all the shit that we have because of it. And, uh, you know, what is super interesting is that if you look at where we are heading to is indeed it's, it's dollar, let's say. Yeah? So that's basically like euro dollar mm. dollar system versus like yeah, the, the BRICS, let's say. But, but both is, is government related systems. Yeah. where they will be able to print money, of course, yeah, because they, they keep control. And then you all yeah. of a sudden have like this this middle ground, this this small thing in the middle, which is privately owned. Yeah? We all run it. <laughs> and a lot of people run it. And uh, more and more people in a lot of countries around the globe run it. So this is like a really a, a public money. Yeah? So it's not the private money of the governments. No, it's the public money of the people. And this is you can choose what you want to use. And this public money will grow and grow and faster and faster as long as these steps are taken into the centralization of both BRICS and the euro dollar system. So yeah. I, I think that Bitcoin shines so bright when we see these moves uh, happening at the moment. And I think also that that's reflected, you know, in, 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 in what we see in, in both price, but also, you know, you know, the flows that you see towards ETFs, uh, uh, what a guy like Larry Fink of, of BlackRock is saying, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's it's a safe haven, you know, like, yeah, it really is. So there's a lot of need for this, which is segregated from government mm-hmm. money. Yeah. And I think that's also yeah, where the path uh, is going to be important in. But yeah. we need to stay decentralized. And that's the most difficult part, especially on the mining side, where I think we will see more problems coming in the in the future yeah let's talk about that in a second what what i find interesting is what what you're saying the you, you see these moves right with, with what the bricks are doing to counter um the dollar and we all know that the dollar is in decline i i, I think it's almost inevitable uh, to um to to you cannot save that anymore right it's really on this downward slope and and it they can they can keep it alive for a long time but what i find interesting is that the fact that that this is now a topic in this presidential race in general is just interesting i think it became it, it it's earlier than we all thought but also i think the right people are in 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 Trump's ear, for example, like he's saying certain things where I think like, hmm, like someone else wrote this, obviously, but they wrote the right thing, you know, and I think the the, the threat that you are illustrating, you know, by the breaks to the US dollar. And for example, I think it was the, the IMF who uh, shared an update on how they look at America and they see, you know, the, the fiscal debt is way too much, etc. Like, there are signs that they that they know they have to do something, right? But it would be like a real reverse Uno if uh, if if the U.S. would adopt Bitcoin in some way, you know, because then they can actually counter that threat of the BRICS. And I think this is in essence what Jason Lowry talks about also with software, right? Like the the the, the entire like the macro global game theory with this is just really really fascinating because it is all happening. Right, if the petrodollar ends and the BRICS actually launch, you know they have all these trials with their internal, um, you know, settlement system. There was some publication last week. Like all this stuff is happening at the same yeah, time. Before and, this, you know, we still have dollarization, right? So if you just look at the graph of uh, currencies being used across the globe, you just mm-hmm. see that the dollar is still growing and rapidly, right? So you see that the euro is dropping rapidly. The dollar is really going up. It's really eating away the euro, and I think for, for, for the next few years, it's still the dollar might grow, you know, like uh, it's not that it's all of a sudden going to... No, 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 I agree. Grow, they they, they no, keep so, it alive. Yeah, and, and like just look at uh, Tether, for instance, eh, who has a huge amount of treasuries being... so, And this, this, this digital dollarization is... It looks like that's actually the first step, right? So if, if, you, if you look at a wallet like Aqua, you know, like that, that's rolling out quite rapidly... Uh, a lot of people just use the dollars because they don't want the fluctuation in in the in the Bitcoin still. So they use this this digital dollar, let's say, and and that's really rapidly being rolled out across the globe. So I think 
Eh? And when people need to choose between a digital yuan or a digital dollar, people will in general choose a digital dollar now because that's something they know. Agree. They will probably not choose for Bitcoin. So I think in the next decade, it will basically be like a two-tiered approach. So still, we will see first more dollarization. And then at some point, you know, Bitcoin comes very rapidly because it actually retains value uh, better and people start to understand what what is happening and what they're doing. And yeah. other countries need to start leading the way on this, right? So to adopt Bitcoin. And the question is, who are going to do that first? And yeah, back to the Netherlands again. As a trading nation, you want to trade with everyone. So you need a ledger where you can trade with everyone with. And in that sense, the Netherlands can be like a, a, a midpoint <laughs> With Bitcoin, you know, so there's a tremendous opportunities there. And if you open yourself up, I think your economy will boom like crazy. And next to that, we have the most important uh, chip uh, machine manufacturer <laughs> of the planet here, ASML. And of course, what would happen is as soon as we dip a little bit into Bitcoin as the Netherlands, ASML will soar like crazy because uh, the chips need to be... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, need to be built. So, like the, the the direct impact and the indirect impact of doing something with Bitcoin in the Netherlands is just, yeah, it's just insane. So, yeah. the question is, which politicians uh, understand this, uh, and when do you get this game theory going on a bit? Uh, as as you're already saying, the US might already be building out a lot of things that we don't really see, and this is actually the, where I see the danger, is that indeed if the hash rate really concentrates let's say yeah in foundry usa which you can clearly see in the mempool mm. yeah, then it becomes clear that uh, they will demand uh, some kind of block templating there where the block and template uh, of of each block with transactions being filled will have some kind of compliant list attached to this and this is an issue because then you know, it becomes more difficult to use Bitcoin easily in other countries for every yeah. way for mm. everyone because they will start to let's say sanction addresses. Yeah, but uh, there will be a huge counter movement also. And if you really study Bitcoin, you will see that in the long term, uh, it will be uh, private mining versus state mining. You know, and that's the long term game. And the question is, yeah, that could be in decades from now so but but in the long term this is where uh, it could play out and the question is uh, are some countries already working with this or preparing for this or going in this direction uh, and pushing bitcoin further down this uh, game theory uh, yeah. on the on this part i think two two things on that i i i don't disagree with you but i think it could go faster but it's just when I think through it, right, I think like if we figure this out, I think someone in a relevant government has also figured it out. It's just, you know, like it, it would be incredibly disappointing, I would say, just, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. you know, if someone didn't figure this out, that, that plus, I feel like the, the, the global game theory, we could talk about it, we can set the pieces. But I think the start is a very tiny, is, is, is a one-time event or thing yeah. or announcement, right? And it doesn't have to be that, that big. You know, it, it, you know as, you, as you say, like, let's say if the Netherlands says, well, we are the trading hub for the world because there's now two blocks of currency, for example, but we still want to buy something in China, but we don't want to use the BRICS currency, but you can exchange it here for Bitcoin, you know, and Bitcoin is the the neutral in between currency. I don't know. I'm just fantasizing yeah. here. That will be very cool, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but like, th that'll be super huge, obviously. Yeah. But but something like this for me, it's it may it's so logical. It makes so much sense, right? Yeah. That I just can't believe that that other people have not figured that out. So I and feel like it, right. This has been Switzerland throughout history. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yes. again, well, that's, if if you pitch someone in a government, would you want to be the Switzerland of the new world? Yeah. Duh. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. And this is indeed, I mean, and you see what you're saying, it could be more rapidly, but because 
if, if you just see these small touch points, eh? so you saw the White House letter on this super small mining location, which was controlled by some Chinese guys mm. through Bermuda, you know, and there was like a, a letter uh, from the White House eh? about about this mining location. I was just like, that's insane, right? That 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 Why the White House attention? actually, yeah, exactly. yeah, that, that that they actually published a letter about this small mining location just controlled by some Chinese folks uh, through Bermuda. Yeah, okay, what the fuck? But this this feels like a game theory thing, yes. you know? Like, holy shit! So who controls the hash? That, is that really where we're where we're looking at here? Is this like the touch point where you're you're aiming for, or is this because you they made it public, right? So mm. they could have just stopped the whole thing like non-public. So why do they make this public? Is this like also something they want to share in public then? And what's what's the idea yeah, behind this? And that, that's exactly what you're super saying, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So exactly what you're saying, like what is happening in the background, there must be a lot. Uh, you, you, you mentioned Jason Laurie, you know, you, I have the software book in, in the back here also that there's, there's a lot of theory in, in the background where you could, yeah, where you could see some game theory playing out here, but I still believe it's really early uh, in that sense. So, yeah. um, I be I believe yeah. that too. It's just more like when I think about this, it's a spectrum of they figured it out just as we figured it out, or we figured it out and they are fucking clueless, which would be just so incredibly bad that that it's just. I, I, I put a lower like percentage on, on that <laughs> yeah. option, right? And 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 so that's kind of how it works. It, it would be deeply saddening if if they are on the on that side of the of the, of the spectrum and they just don't really know what they're doing. Because for example, that's that's kind of how I felt with this uh, Ethereum ETF, uh, you know, crazy turnaround within a week. You know, uh, you see Trump at some random rally answered to a question from a guy in the crowd like hey do you like crypto oh yeah crypto is great what are, oh, crypto 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 you know I, I i only see someone from the biden team like laying on the couch watching this presser and they're like shit he's pro crypto oh no we have to do something yeah, what do we do you know that's how clear. i feel it's you know? very clear uh, yeah. that in this speech also he said that yeah i support the 50 million 50 million people you know in the u.s that so and this yeah. is a similar thing, right? In, but no, is but it in, that important? No, but it's vote. It, it's just vote hurting. That's how I feel like it is. And I agree. But yeah. wait, wait. It, yeah. th there's more topics that touch the same 50 million people, right? So, yeah. so again, it's either he has no clue. He probably has no clue, and this is just like a communication line, and he talks like that, right? Just to 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 get to these 50 million people. Yeah. But let's say they really identify 15 million people for which. For for who Bitcoin and crypto is a real election point, then we are not that early. If that is really like it's yeah, an election yeah, yeah. point for you and me, right? But fifty million Americans like you and me, I don't think so, right? Yeah, so it's either it's again. If if you look at the uh, perspective, right? So if you have like how many people will have read the Genesis book? You know, like about the origins of Bitcoin, about what Bitcoin really is. How many people run a node? You know, how many so going really into like what bitcoin yeah. is versus uh, then crypto which is uh, very big and in that sense you know the difference between bitcoin and crypto i think you can explain very well and you've done that in your podcast because you've seen both sides from close by i think mm -hmm. so y you know that there's a huge difference there and uh, this is something that 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 still needs to be explained thoroughly because that's where the, the, the mix-up and the mismatch is uh, in the general public, I think, still. Yeah. So, so how, do you, how do you think that we would, would get there, right? So if we look back at, at your story maybe a bit, I, I think it's interesting because before you started with the podcast, we already discussed like a bit like what you were going to do. You, you were searching. Mm -hmm. So, so why, why did you get to this point that you get this podcast going instead of like go on a crypto tour and try to get rich, let's say. Well, I, I talked about uh, crypto or Web3 also in, in, in some podcasts as a guest myself. Like I see, I, 
and at that point, I kind of understood the difference. But now, how I explain it right now is, is crypto is an attempt by startup teams, by, by teams of people to create an a- ecosystem in which a token that they created fuels the use in that ecosystem, right? And so if that ecosystem becomes big enough, if enough people use it to solve their problems or fulfill their needs, then that token has value. So in that sense, you know, although, you know, I, I, I don't like the whole origin story of Ethereum, et cetera, like that concept concept does hold up for ethereum right it's an it's an ecosystem like a decentralized supercomputer etc you can build apps and you use eth as the, as the gas to power the the uh, the apps or that or that network you know makes sense if enough people use it then yes that token has value in some way but it's it's exactly that description it's not ultrasound money or all the all these things it's 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 a token that represents a certain value within an ecosystem created to solve a certain problem or fulfill a certain need, which is totally different than than Bitcoin, which is a Nobel Prize level discovery or invention of something that we've never seen in the world. That that, for example, my you know, provable finite digital scarcity. It's what Michael Saylor compares it to time. There, the only thing in in our real you know, life that you can compare Bitcoin to is time, yeah. which is incredibly crazy to say. Like uh, I didn't, uh, like me five years ago, wouldn't think, uh, you know, that that I would say this now, but I do see it. It's it's that, like, we discovered scarcity, like true, true verifiable scarcity, which is one, once you dive into that more, it just touches upon everything. Everything in our lives, every I, I, I say to my like progressive millennial friends, like everything you would want to fix in the world is broken because the money is broken. Broken money creates wrong incentives. So we have to fix the money and we can only fix the money if we have an apolitical, a religious, like all these things, just a, a neutral, decentralized money that we can use to exchange value uh, with each other. So that's kind of how I how I explain it now. But but I had to do the shit coining before I did the bitcoining more because it's it when you when you when you like technology or like digital products or the internet etc. You know you hear something like blockchain, and you know all these all these projects use a form of a blockchain, right? And so if you just look at it at, uh, from a blockchain perspective, then every everything is in the same. Uh, bucket basically yeah you know, and there, and it, have... there it comes right this is where you so you can have the most beautiful stories and you know in the in in the bitcoin world you you will see a lot of people in podcasts with the most beautiful stories but it all comes back to physical reality hmm. and then the question is always very simple where do you have the database because it's very simple yeah eh? your bank account these days, it's your phone, right? So the bank account is on the phone. It's just ones and zeros in a database. Where is the freaking database? Mm-hmm. How many people make use of this database? So how many people actually work on this database? And is this an open database or a closed database? Mm-hmm. That's the core physical questions. And mm-hmm. it's one and zero, eh? so it's transistors. They're just very small, it's, but it's physical, All right? So off. it's really a one yeah. and a zero. It's yeah. a one and a zero. Yeah. And then the question is, if you look at the physical reality, is it not many databases, you know? And is the entire history stored hmm. or not? And then if you just ask these very basic questions, like 99% becomes very difficult to explain. Because, okay, is someone checking the entire history of what happened? Yeah, in Bitcoin, it's like the entire history. Everyone is running a super cheap computer at home with a small hard disk. And they are all doing the entire history check. And everything is there. And there's so many people across the globe doing this. Mm. And then the miners, there are so many people, you know, plugging in now, open source, you know, like BitAxis. Everywhere across the across the globe, everyone is mining little blocks. You know, everyone wants to participate on this global network. 
the physical touch point, the physical hardware is with Bitcoin. And that's where we also see the attack factor of the energy, you know, like, oh, it's bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. I have the sticker here, which says zero emission electric miner, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, no, but literally, yeah. if you don't have sufficient machines in the physical reality, then the system will be captured. That's mm -hmm. just how it works. Because yeah. you physically capture the database where the transactions are happening. And as all transactions these days are happening digitally, so on a fucking database somewhere, you know, <laughs> this is the attack factor. And yeah. that's also in a broader game theoretical uh, perspective, that's where you see this play out, right? So you have this super tiny bank in the Netherlands. Where are the databases? Probably some foreign power knows where these databases are. So if they drop these three bombs where they have these databases, the entire bank is gone. Yeah. But this is something that is not in anyone's yes, mind, yes, right? Yes, yes, so yes. It's, it, this is so scary also from my perspective. So for me, like Bitcoin, which is like everything is nuked, it will still run, you know? Like it's just like such a solid digital monetary database that will always work no matter what happens across the globe. And I can't say that for any other monetary system. Yeah. So, but this this this, physically, this, right? this goes back to what what we said what I said to you before we started recording. Yeah. This is factually true. Okay. One, if people hear this, right? Because I, by the way, I would even say the database is not on your phone. Your phone is a viewer for one number <laughs> in the entire database, right? Yeah. And, exactly. and that number in your banking app does not represent real coins and 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 bills that are stored in 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 a vault, in a vault like Scrooge <laughs> McDuck, right? They are not there. Okay. Yeah. But let's say you hear this factual truth. Most people will not act on this because it's very harsh. Like, like the implications of what you are saying are 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 worldview shattering. Because yep. you are trusting a third party to store the monetary energy that that you gathered with your job or your venture, yep. yeah. And that is real. Your time is real. Your energy is real, right? And then you store that reward into something that is not real. It's not real. It's it's literally fake. It's, it's fake, and it's not there. You know, and and that is is so hard. It's so hard to to actually integrate that realization because that it's goes. A, yeah, but you're yeah. saying it's not. It's actually real because it's physical ones and zeros in a certain database somewhere. Okay, but it's okay. just like what does it represent? And that's where you come back. That's to. a good point. Yeah. yeah. So, so because in What's the, the end, perception you have of yeah. it, let's let's call yeah, it but that. Yeah. Just 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 take this one step further or back. I think yeah, back because back, if, yeah. if 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 you go one step back, it, it's just if you have this bank which actually has this database of these ones and zeros, do you actually want to be part of this small database for a couple million people somewhere local, you know, on this planet? No, Good I point. actually prefer to be in a database where actually the ones and zeros are distributed across the planet, and everyone can check on these ones and zeros too, right? So yes. this bank will never fail. So just looking at it from the bank perspective and also on the physical level. And I think that's also something that we in general don't really talk about with Bitcoin. But if you just go through the story physically, <laughs> then it becomes quite apparent that it's all ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. And that's actually quite scary for many, many people because not that long ago, it was felt as being physical. And most people still believe it's indeed something physical. And that's where you also yeah. say it's not real. And then if you just talk here on the street with people, they say, ah, Bitcoin, I can't touch it. And then exactly you come to the point, yeah, but you can't touch your euro, right? No, no, no. I have this banknote. You know, I have this yeah, banknote yeah, yeah, here yeah. and I can touch it. And that's where people still have this physical representation but where then they see value. Well, it's funny because that banknote is not the same as bank money, right? The yeah. the, the currency note, the, the the right. That that's the government money. That's not the bank slash private private 
money, right? And so even well, that that's a that's a that's a whole podcast by itself, I'd yeah. say. But but that's what I mean with the perception of it, right? And I think when you say it's ones and zeros, I think it's a great example, right? You are just in one database. Let's say you are with one bank. You are in one database of one bank. That's where all the numbers get crunched. And when you look at your bank app and you see a number, it's literally the number yeah. that's in the database at <laughs> with your account number, right? Yeah. Sometimes in the Netherlands, we've seen that people had the wrong amount on their app, yeah. right? That's great, right? Yeah, I, 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 oh my God. It, it's, but, but, but these, the, the fact that these things happen and are real and they're like, oh, we had a problem with our database, right? And now we fixed it. Like millions of people trust a PR message like that. Oh, the bank fixed it for me. Well, Jolly, you know, uh, yes, uh, you know, <laughs> now, now, now it's correct again, correct, and and that is, I think, you know, what what we see now is just that that behavior is something that eventually you have to run into yourself in some way, right? Because you are you you are uh, how do you say that like. Um, outsourcing your responsibility over that money to some company, some random engineers at, at yeah. a random bank that fix the database for you. Like, wow. You know, and, and, and as you said, the, the Bitcoin database is zeros and ones, but it's checked by 20,000 nodes every 10 minutes, you know, or every, at any moment, basically. Yeah. And that is what should give you the safety. You know, yeah. that, that is what actually gives you the safety and they are zeros and ones. Yeah. But, and also when people, someone says it's not physical, I can write down letters and numbers with a pen on a paper and it can represent a billion dollars. Like that is, yeah. for me, that is mind blowing about Bitcoin. That How tangible is that? You know, it's just yeah. letters and numbers. No, but in the end, again, like already more than a decade ago, I, w I always said like, if Apple, you know, comes with their... Apple money and Apple bank, you know, I would probably just dump all my euros into the Apple bank account because I have more trust in Apple than in any bank in this country because the, the scary part about the banks is they are just built for this couple of million people in this small location on this planet with bad databasing and poor engineering because it's like too local, it's too small, it's not built for the masses. So I would expect that like Apple would become a bank and then everyone would dump their money with Apple and then at least you would be running your bank there. But of course, like Facebook tried this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Facebook yeah. tried to bring the Libra there and then uh, uh, government doesn't allow this. So the, the thing is that even if you would expect this to happen, governments are not allowing it. And it's all being killed. So the only thing that, that can survive now is something eh, that comes in a slight roundabout way <laughs> that they can <laughs> stop. Yeah. And that's where we are at now, right? So we are now at the point where we need this all to be safe, <laughs> first and foremost, I think. And then for, for the future of mankind to actually trade in peace with everyone in the fastest way, internet money, magic internet money, so we can all cooperate on a global scale. The only place where I see this happening is currently Bitcoin. I don't see it in any other way. Mm. And that's where I would love to see it go. And before Bitcoin, my mind was more on like some really global corporations that are global anyway, that would perform this bank task. But now, you know, we have a much better system where these global corporations can't corrupt this databasing system. And yeah. this is where we are at now. So, and I hope to see in the next few years, some of these large global corporations uh, actually, you know, implement Bitcoin uh, in, into their company. And I think we saw a glimpse of that already with Tesla, right? So they started accepting Bitcoin in, uh, in the US. Uh, they used BTC Pay server there, you know. Uh, but why did they stop? And I think this is like a similar story as to what you see with Facebook. You know, you try to build something, but you were, they were even stopped before it got live. Like if the Chinese would just say to, to Musk, oh, nice, you accept Bitcoin? We take your factory. I think you will stop accepting mm -hmm. Bitcoin, right? So yeah. 
these corporations can all be pressured in such a, a great amount by these governments. But at some point, game theory comes in play. And, yeah. and, and that's the tipping point. And uh, we will see that in the next couple of years. Yeah. But yeah. Let's this see. is so fascinating. This, this is yep. this. I, I, I love that you give this example because this, these are these little incidents that could show you that, for example, in the example you had, right? Like, let's say governments against Libra or, um, you know, and any type of attempt to create another money is instantly killed by governments. You know. For your for your protection, yeah, you know, and, and it's it's these little incidents. I hope that will show people that no, it's not in your interest. It's in the interest of the entity that's creating the money. You know, which is a very logical conclusion. It doesn't even have to be in, in a malicious way or evil or blah blah like all these things. It's no. just for the conservation of the entity that that is yeah, the government, course. right? And and so it, it's just a logical. It's just a logical thing, and I think I think it's important to emphasize that too, right? It's not about like, uh, oh, someone controls the money and they're bad and evil and blah blah. No, they control the money and they want to keep it that way. Like, of course, like, duh. <laughs> you know, like, it's you just... want to you want to 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 keep the control there uh, that you, that you yeah. already have. And yeah, if but imagine if it's yeah. so easy to subvert a currency. With just a few companies, you know, like the Libra project that are like, oh, well, yeah, let's let's try this out. Yeah, that was enough. That was enough. A signal. It it didn't even launch. Yeah, it was already enough of a signal for the government, uh, the U.S. government to say, no, no, that's not going to happen. How, how much more of a signal do you need? It's yeah. so fragile that that even the concept of talking about it and, and, and launching yeah. a presser. It gives that and, reaction, and, and, you know? and take it then back to China. Eh? We, you have, of course, uh, WePay, you know, and uh, and Alipay there. Uh, who was controlling uh, Alipay? You know, like uh, Mr. Alibaba. Uh, Jack got quite some issues at some point, eh? and uh, yeah, at some exactly. point, everyone was, "Oh, where where did Jack go?" You know, like uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, you become yeah, too powerful. You become simply too powerful. And then, of course, government comes in. And that's just how it works, you know. And uh, look at Mr. Binance now, you know. He's in jail. Uh, when you become too big, they will come for you. So uh, it has to be uh, millions and millions of people that just uh, run it and uh, do it. And then at some point, it will, it will work out. But that's the struggle uh, where it's going to go through. Yeah. All right, so now my second question. Oh, did we just answer the first? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we just we just went for it. No, but like we are talking about this, and I wanted to ask you also, like you are you are a fellow millennial, you know, and I always ask like all the all the guests, especially when they are millennials, like we, we are just shooting the shit here, you know. But like, how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with like other millennials? Do you have like, like you, you probably have people in your life that are not into Bitcoin that are maybe bored by you just talking about it all the time. Like, how, how, how does what does your environment look like? Yeah, so I have a lot of friends who are not in Bitcoin at all, and uh, of course, I gave when they uh, got children, I gave them Bitcoin, and I said on an open dime, you know, I just put it in your vault and. Uh, let them come after 10 years because then we will check uh, the chip qual quality if it's still okay and then probably put it somewhere else. But at least that they can go and study uh, when they're uh, turning 18 or 20. So uh, I did that with all my friends. Cool. And they, th they, I, I think they, they, they thought because that's already quite a while ago that I'm a, I'm a bit of a strange guy in that sense, you know, like uh, maybe uh, not, not thinking too positive or something about the future with, with, with Bitcoin. But I'm actually really positive in that sense because uh, I see this uh, shining light there. Mm. And um, Bitcoin will bring a lot of good for the next generations. Uh, the question is uh, where these locations that move first will be. And I think we already see some glimpses there. But um, if in that sense, you know, the Netherlands is not this shining light, um, then a lot of people will leave that I know. And a lot of people have already left, but I think it will increase rapidly. 
So, uh, but also people that are not into Bitcoin at all, right? So it's just like when uh, it becomes so much more expensive to to be here while you can earn a similar amount, but keep so much more somewhere else, a lot of people will want to leave. And that's something that I in general see in my generation. So people don't have a solid base anymore. And that's where I grew up in. So if I just go back to my parents, you know, it was super solid. I grew up between all the farms, you know, four kilometers of nothing to see. We ran around on the on the ice in the winter and really enjoyed enjoyed the farmer's life, let's say. And I always thought that I would live there forever, you know, uh, and maybe travel a lot, but I, that would be my base. And currently, uh, I don't see this as a base. And I think more than half of my uh, friends that are around my age are also looking at it in a more fluent way. And this is really bad, right? Because you need a solid base to actually build things for the long mm. term. Yes. And that's something that that I, I really sense and feel. Um, and that that, of course, is not in that sense positive. <laughs> Um, but these shining lights that are there where people might move and really build, you know, like do their proof of work and build it up. And I think we see that eh? these shining stars that are, are popping up already that I hope to achieve here because that would bring a bright future here. And that's where I'm still like hoping for and, and building towards too. So I really want to show, I, I send a, a letter to the, the finance department in the Netherlands with an open invitation. Come look at our companies, you know, the exchanges that we have. We have really great exchanges in the Netherlands with proper proof of reserves, you know, like something that you want to see. Next to that, we have very impressive mining facilities, stabilizing our grid and heating our food in the greenhouses. I want to show you this. Please come along and see what this means, you know, like in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. And you still don't get a reply. And that's something that in that sense scares me. So as I'm saying, next week I'm in parliament, but that's not the broad range. I want to 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 have the entire, you know, like finance department, you yeah. know, from all parties, left and right. I want I want them to at least be curious and and take up this invitation and then see what we're actually building and what we're doing. Because I don't think many people have an idea. So if you look at NSC, one of the largest political parties now in the Netherlands, it was very nice because we had a, a debate about cryptocurrency. And they, they actually, there's a really nice passage, passage in, the, uh, in, the, in the, how do you say that? Yeah, yeah the, the notes. The agreement. There, where, yeah. They, where they actually said, yeah, Bitcoin is anonymous, but isn't it also a transparent ledger? <laughs> So they, nice. are, they were actually contradicting themselves in this sentence. And the yeah, NSC so group was asking this question. So you see the lack of education that is still there with one of the largest political parties. And that's something that we really need to mm. speed up. But they need to be open for it, right? Because yeah. yeah, we can bang the doors, whatever we want. But if they're not open for it, yeah, then these questions will be asked for, for the next couple of years still. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's also, it's, it's, uh, I don't think it's a surprise that they are not educated, right? I think eventually it's all about, about the incentives and the incentive. Well, it depends. I think the incentive to look at something alternative like Bitcoin is super relevant. I, I think that's what we both see and a lot of people see. But yeah, when you're in the center of, of power, that is probably outside of your your field of, of vision in some sense, right? Like if you don't have to take it seriously, then why 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 would you? Right? But for me that that also ties back to that game theory, right? Like it's that 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 hubris in some sense that yeah. actually makes them finish or get it lost. And that is so fascinating. Like that paradox for me is very fascinating. That that like you that that what you've built, you know, and especially our country, if we don't maintain it or, or or stay vigilant about what we have and appreciate 
what we have. You know, we will not be humble enough to see anything new that's happening in the world. And the funny fact is that literally our country already experienced the downfall of being the global reserve currency, right? So it already happened in in the in the past. And I I, I love that paradox. I, I I love it. I absolutely love it. It's the same as with like corporate innovation, right? Like most corporate companies are are already uh, unbundled by thousands of startups that take yeah. like you know do one little service of what they have put together in for example you know let's say a, a traditional finance corporate like they 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 don't realize that they are already done but they have some sort of cash cow that, that keeps them running for a few years and the well, same you know yeah exactly what you're saying like the interesting part is here like if you go back to that old reserve currency status uh, it's really well documented. Eh? So uh, in the Netherlands, we had the house prices in Amsterdam. They they were perfectly documented. And then when the new world reserve currency came, the house prices in the new currency actually became that all the house prices in Amsterdam dropped 80%. <laughs> hmm. yeah. So the entire real estate in Amsterdam was devalued with 80% on average. And if if you if you think about this back then then you see this store of value being now eh, in real estate in the Netherlands like i i i had some real estate and i sold it because uh, i felt like this was not going to be sustainable where we are in and expressed in the new reserve currency you'll be fucked if you hold this currency right and if you in this currency where you're in, okay, it looks still going up, but in the new world reserve currency, you're losing a shit ton. So, uh, and that's actually what we what we already experience a little bit in Bitcoin, but it will it will become much more clear in the next couple of years that real estate is just simply not the safe haven. Yeah. And when I, yeah, when I say to people that. Real estate is not going up forever, uh, and then people don't believe me still. So, yeah, I think this paradigm shift will come, but it will take time. Yeah, definitely will take time. And you see, you know what I like is it's already happening. What you are saying is already happening, right? And so, I I think it is a fight, right? As you illustrated, it is a fight. We have to educate people, but. But in some sense, like the truth is on our side because we have proof. You know, it's uh, I, I I had a tweet yesterday, uh, like uh, there, there was a video I saw by, by a guy who explained like believing versus knowing. And you can only believe in something if you don't know it, for example. And I said, well, crypto is believing, you know, Bitcoin yeah. is knowing. But it's 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 the knowing part that is nice but also frustrating right because i honestly think and 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 also for you we could sit in any you know theater or whatever like some room and people could ask us any question and we would have any all the answers to that question and and ask people questions back as well right like why do you think this or why do you ask this can you explain this to me you know like i i know that we know right but that doesn't mean that other people know and they still no, believe this is, in this other the, thing, the, the, you know, and, and that, you know, that's this is just the scary it. Part, that's the right? game. So, that's the game. But, but yeah. what you're saying, wait, I'll grab something, is, is basically, let's see, I have it here. Yeah. It's basically, it's this. And this is the scary part because it, it's always the physical thing, right? So you, you just said knowing, eh? Knowing. Uh, knowing yeah. is owning. So there's this really nice. This is a guy from Sweden who oh, built nice. this. It's called knowing is owning. Yeah. And this is something you, of course, discussed also uh, with with some people on your podcast, uh, the famous people. So <laughs> not the plebs like me. But if you look like this thing, this thing, I'm, I'm just holding it on the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bird yeah. demo. It says. Yeah, it's a demo. It, it has. Uh, it's not numbers, so it's not it's word not word one, but it's actually you can see. I think you can see it's actually you know what we have in the sky. So you can actually mm. remember the dots on this disk, and that's the access to your Bitcoin. That's sick. Yeah, knowing is owning. It's yeah. in the physical reality. 
People yes. don't understand that this thing yes. will last for a thousand years. If someone finds this and knows this code, this distributed network of computers, wherever they are at that moment in a thousand years, will have access to this absolutely scarce monetary base that we build as a human society. And it's all physical. But this part is mo always lost because people still think that Bitcoin is just some digital currency. No, it's actually most tied to the real world mm. as anything. Yes. And that's why knowing is owning. You can travel across the globe with something in your head and you will be able to exchange it everywhere for whatever you need. And that's just completely insane. And this is yeah, so far out from the mainstream. They, they don't see this yet. Yeah. And as you're saying, also with the millions of, uh, yeah, millions of people, uh, the 50 million people in, uh, in the US, this is exactly the thing. Like of these 50 million people, the majority holds something on an exchange. And then a very small part on this planet holds something physically. And luckily that's growing <laughs> because otherwise yeah. uh, the shop wouldn't grow. But... This is the real shift, you know, and it takes a lot of time before you get to that point where you understand yeah. that knowing is owning. Yeah. I love the um, distinction what I learned about property and ownership. So I would even take it further because in, in, in this world, owning something doesn't actually mean it's your property, right? Yeah. I think yeah. in, in Dutch... Um, yeah, there are words for it. I think in English, like ownership and property is better, right? But like for me, ownership is something that is kind of like abstracted, right? Like you have a title deed to your house yeah. or some stocks, right? Like yeah. Bert owns this stock and there's, there's, there's two autographs and then, you know, okay. But it's not property. You don't have it. Right, you don't have yep. it. You cannot like the, the the journalist I talked to. She's not into gold and not into Bitcoin yet, but she's into stocks. And then she asked me the question: What if you know? Um, I don't know. Like shit hits the fan, and there's like a war, and you have to leave. I said, Well, I leave with the Bitcoin in my head, and you're gonna call your stockbroker and be like, Well, you know, uh, I, I want to sell my stock or take my stock. Like, what are you doing? You know, the fact that you have to call someone to get what you think you own means you don't own it right and just just that 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 difference between property actually having it and owning it ownership like on paper is such a, a massively different thing but taking property of you know the monetary energy that you gathered is also really scary yep. i i was talking to a friend who has no bitcoin but he's rich and he said to me Oh, but that if I have a million in Bitcoin, I, I'm the only one who's guarding this. I said, yeah. It's like, no, that's very scary. <laughs> you know, I said, yes, that's true. But you actually, it's, it's, it's your property. That, that million now in the bank is not yours. It's, it's, it's contractually not, not yours. So you have to understand that too. You're scared of something without understanding what what you're currently participating in and i think you alluded to that earlier like yeah. bitcoin is just another system it's just another system that you can participate in and you can still move to it freely and totally conscious and you can choose to adopt that system versus the system that you're currently in you you never chose to be in that yeah and that's also why you don't understand it because no yeah, one ever it, explains just what it. you're now mentioning is actually also the scary part right so because Someone walks in here with a gun. You know, there was another podcast mm -hmm. guy in the Netherlands who had that. Eh? Yeah, 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 guy yeah, yeah. Walked in, you know, yeah. to take his Bitcoin. The, the thing is, you can also properly protect it and distribute it across the globe, right? So you can, you can lay the keys around and you need multiple keys to actually be able to access mm -hmm. it. And if you trust people, you have nice people in your surroundings, you can actually distribute it among people also. You can have a pot there, you know, like, and distribute these keys. So the, 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 the beautiful thing is like, if you shoot someone, you cannot take it. Mm. So that's wild. That's, that's, crazy. that's just su such an insane thing. So this, this physical thing, yeah, you can find it that, that, that doesn't hold any value because you need other things too, right? So mm. the thing is like, you have the physical thing 
but always a little part is there, like a passphrase or it's a multisig. You need more things. And yeah. that's almost always in the minds of one or multiple people. And that's really insane because all of a sudden, this time-saving technology, this monetary value is actually kept within these people. And it makes it very Roots hard to say. You are the Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, you are the Bitcoin, exactly. And, that, and, that, and that's just completely insane. Like also we have yeah. like these, these really tiny seeds. They're called tiny seeds in our web shop. And we sell them to people that travel a lot because they're not detected in, uh, in the x-rays on the airports. Oh, wow. Yeah, so people can actually travel with their seed and not remember every, because that's quite hard. So uh, they put the, the seed, you know, they can saw it somewhere in there. And it's super tiny, so it cannot be detected easily. You know, like these kind of things people think about and that people are really travel with this kind of uh, freedom money across the globe is, is just fantastic. And yeah. even if they would do something about the tiny seed, then people would still be able to do it in their head, right? So I, I think this shift is still very far out from general understanding. Yeah. And... As you're saying, it's scary. It's scary if you don't know exactly how to do this uh, stuff. And luckily, there are a lot of people helping out on this already. Yeah. Uh, but you have to be, yeah, you have to be, yeah, also a little bit wary because there are also, of course, scammers in this. Uh, in yeah, the yeah, room. yeah. No, but what yeah. what I try to point to, yes, I agree. You you need to learn about it. For him, it was only the concept. Yeah, that already scared him, yeah. right? And I like to have like those conversations because then I'm like, okay, let's just conceptually talk about this, right? Yeah. Like, if you call the bank now and you want to get a hundred k of your million out, some girl or or man who or woman or man who has a certain job, you know, task list description, whatever, it's going to be like, oh, a hundred k that's above this limit. What do you want to do with it, sir? What you know, like you're going to have a conversation with someone who's just you know um executing their job but they are they are standing in front of a door between you and that what you think you well you won't own. get it you won't get 100k <laughs> out of bank <laughs> and it's not to protect you right and so yeah. I, I i i i talked yeah. with him through this and i said well you don't like i don't care if you buy bitcoin or not i'm just trying to help you get to the point where you start thinking about how Am I really in control of my life? Am I really in control of the reward that I got for spending my time and energy, my most finite resource? You yeah. know? And the answer is just no. And yeah. and like, it's not, not a nice realization, but it is the answer. And then once you understand that that is the answer, you have a big choice. You have a choice to ignore that and just you know continue ignoring it, you know, with yeah. like like the matrix, red pill, blue pill type yeah. thing. Or you can be like, Okay, well, if it really works like that, what can I do about it, right? And and that was the case for me, and I, I shared that a lot already on this podcast. But like, I was thirty, and I worked at a bank, and I had a mortgage, and I was already into Bitcoin. And then a colleague explained to me why the money in the bank wasn't mine, and I was like, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" <laughs> and then after he explained it to yeah. me, I was like, "I'm an idiot." And that's how I felt. Like I, I felt like an idiot. I'm participating in a system I don't understand. Like, what am I doing? And like for me. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm lucky that I'm wired that way, but I could not accept that. I I, I couldn't accept that I, I didn't understand what I was participating in. So that kind of pushed me more toward just more studying and, and trying to get the information that got me to actually form an opinion about what I was participating in, I think. Yeah. And yeah, this is the scary part, right? Where people trust... Eh? And we always say, don't trust, verify. And then you have this trust percentage that is carefully managed, you know, that how many people actually trust the banks at the moment? Do we need to have a campaign that people get trust in the banks again? You know, like, this is actually what's happening. It's just insane. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it will take time before people wake up, but it will come at some point. And uh, then I'm just quoting the, central bank uh, <laughs> christine so uh, it will come and uh, that's also where uh, everyone is of course scared of because uh, as she once said if there's an uh, exit the, it will be used uh, 
So, but the difficulty is if you don't allow your people to go through the exit, uh, you will get a lot of angry people and you will also get a very poor society for it. So uh, at some point, you know, this is the decision that has to be made somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how fast that will come. De- depends on hard they, how hard they push, I think. But yeah, that's a fair point. I don't know either, but that's why it's fun to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it's also not nice, right? It, we, yeah. we can all say, oh, it's very beautiful. And I'm positive about Bitcoin in the future, but mm-hmm. the transitional period yeah, can be yeah, very yeah, yeah. messy. Yes. And it really depends on which location you are in on this planet. Yeah. And if it becomes messy, yeah, that's not... You don't want to be in a messy situation where this transition no. goes very, very roughly, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's just, Yeah, it's hard to predict. I like what you said about, you know, that you want to stay and do something here, but there's also people leaving. You know, uh, I, I once heard a guy, uh, an American guy say like, yeah, all these people going to El Salvador, they're pussies. <laughs> you got to stay here and fight the fight here. And I think that is true too. But it's also true what you're saying. Like, yeah, do you... yeah, there is a breaking big, point, right? It's big so, questions. Yeah, but there right? is a breaking point. That's the difficult part. But mm. the question is indeed like, now it was really nice. We had the, the, the Bitcoin standard. It was like 80 books, two weeks. And that's the Dutch translation I'm talking yeah, about. Eh? Cool. So <laughs> we are yeah. in the niche of the niche. Eh? There's, there's yeah, a couple yeah, yeah. million people in this country. It, so it was sold out in two weeks. And then the printer was not an ecb printer it couldn't keep up and uh so it it took a couple of weeks to refill and then uh today i shipped again 16 pieces of the dutch uh, bitcoin standard and you see that people are educating themselves and if you just think back of your own path you know you you see where some touch points were were already there and for me the bitcoin standard was also a really nice uh insight that i got and the book was written only in 2018, I think. Uh, and the Dutch translation is only from a couple of years ago. And some volunteers just translated it. Mm. Uh, if you listen to the audio book, you hear me, <laughs> which is actually <laughs> really cool. weird, right? So just these volunteers and these guys that wanted to share the message took this upon themselves. And that's why this book is translated in, in Dutch with all the other books combined. And now people start to actually yeah educate themselves through these books so it's nice that this became available but it's all because of these people in bitcoin that that want to propagate this message and educate yeah and this first part i think this monetary part that's where first the first people will get in and it's always first some skin in the game and then after that they start educating themselves and then to guide them to the next Step is going to be the most difficult part because a lot of people get lost on other databases part, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> other yeah. databases, that's yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I saw in, in your Twitter or X bio it says I'm visiting Earth as a Bitcoin engineer. And I wondered how did Bitcoin give you purpose in life? Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm living the 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 road to a uh, Bitcoin, uh, hyper Bitcoinization, let's say, uh, because I'm at the forefront now. I feel all of a sudden, while I'm quite late in the industry, but yeah, having the role that I have now in combination with the company just uh, growing, just helping more and more people with with home mining, but also just mining in general. Uh, on the educational part, we see a lot of growth. It's really nice to to be in that sense so early. Um, so I I hope I hope to see that the Netherlands educates itself rapidly enough. So we and not just us two, but a lot of people with us uh, want to build from here. And I think there are a lot of people. Uh, you, if you just see at uh, the companies that are currently there, from the 1st of January, when MICAR, so the European legislation comes into effect, all these companies 
will not be based in Europe anymore because it's basically not possible anymore. Mm. And this is the scary thing. Uh, huh? China copies US invents and uh, Europe regulates. That's basically <laughs> how you currently <laughs> see the planet. Uh, that That's something that I hope we can we can put a break on and then it would be good for uh, for the dutch people but uh, it's going to be a real struggle i i, I believe and uh, my heart takes for bitcoin and uh, we'll see how far we can uh, stretch this in the netherlands but uh, otherwise we'll do it anywhere on the planet right love that i also wanted to ask you what does proof of work mean to you yeah you have to show the work. So what you are doing, you didn't really know what to do. So what did you do? You started to create podcasts. Something. Yeah. yeah. And you just told me before we went into this call, right? Where's this heading? I don't know. Forward. <laughs> yeah, but you will keep on do putting work in, right? You mm. keep on editing inviting all these people put the proof of work in it's mm. all about the physical proof of work you create physical proof of work by interviewing people i'm creating physical proof of work by helping thousands of bitcoiners in the netherlands to actually get on the right path at least that's what i'm trying to do yeah and i think that's what proof of work for me is and apart from that proof of work is of course the protocol thing that we all name so not proof of stake. So not by force and by having a big bag being able to determine what happens. No, you have to put work in to actually be a part of something. And I think that's what we are showing both. Uh, and I hope a lot of people join us in this proof of work way of living. Uh, and as we always said in the ports, uh, there's 24 hours uh, in the day and then we still have the night to work. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> so, well, what I what I like about that is, you know, like you see, you see, Bitcoin is a real community, right? Like I, uh, I think it was last week I had a tweet. Like it's just, I find it so incredible that, uh, like, I know surgeons now and lawyers and real estate people and I don't know people, people from any background and any expertise, right? And I think uh, first time you and I ever talked, I think you ended with, well, if you're ever around, the door is open. And uh, then I, I, I actually met someone else who said like, yeah, the door is literally open at Bert's place. Like I had coffee with his mom or something, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think that is so great, you know, like that Bitcoin really fosters this, this community building and it's really it's really being interested in other people, and uh, yeah, I want—I just want to ask you about that. Like, why? Why do you think that is? Why? Why does it? Why does it foster this community building so much? What do you see, bro? Um, for me, what I make of it is that I, although you and I are from different backgrounds, we we challenged our mind to eventually understand the, this thing that is Bitcoin and I think what it can bring to the world as we just talked about for over an hour. Um, and I think that is what connects us. Just the fact that, that, well, at least that's for me, that's what I see, that like I don't have to understand fully where you come from or who you are or your upbringing or beliefs or exactly. all these things. Like, I know you did the work to understand this and, again, challenge your mind just the same as I did. And that is a lot of work. Uh, and and so I think there's, like, a mutual understanding and respect for that, uh, for, for doing that. And I think that is what connects uh, people in, in Bitcoin so uh, so easily. And, and, and we all feel inclined to contribute something in some way even if it's just randomly talking for an hour, like uh, I, I, I reached out to you a few yeah. few months back um, and you were like, yeah, sure. And I, I, I don't know, I, something like that. I, I, I don't know exactly. So I was interested to hear your thoughts. It's the curious. Think, For me, it's the curious. Like we are at the, at the, at the stage where 
it's still the curious minds that mm-hmm. I get I get mails daily. Uh, so uh, can can we meet? Uh, can I work at your company? Can uh, we have a talk? You know. Mm-hmm. And of course, I, I used to do this <laughs> quite often uh, in the past few years. But at the moment, I just ca- I can't do it anymore. Like I get these kind of mails daily, which warms my heart. But I I can't do it anymore. So the yeah. the, the the amazing thing is that it's the curious, like which people would actually send an email. And say, oh, I, I'm really interested to learn more. Can you help me out? Can we? And I, I did this, you know, I, I did this with, 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 I, I think, far over a hundred people already. And I, I tried to guide everyone on the way. But now we do it more digitally, right? So we did a workshop just before Bitcoin Arnhem, uh, and that's also recorded. So we will launch it on the website soon, and on the YouTube, and of course on Noster also. Uh, and there were. I, I was astonished because I, I I organized a workshop and I rented this little place and it costed me more than 400 euros. And I was expecting maybe 10 people for the workshop. It was the day before the conference. And let's see, mm-hmm. you know, who wants to go for a workshop. And I asked 21 euros because I wanted to at least cover a bit of the cost of the 400 euros of the rental. And, and then it went up and up. And then at some point we were at 30 people that were going to attend. And I was like, yeah, most of the time, half of the people don't attend, so it will be fine. But it was really like more people want to attend. So we had to change the venue to a larger venue, rented the place for over 700 euros. And then you still hope that it gets full enough. And then I was standing there and there were more than 50 people. And very cool. 40 paid. (laughs) So I was was out (laughs) of the cost. But it was amazing, right? So there's a community here that wants to learn in depth because who, who the hell goes to a mining workshop, right? And <laughs> and yeah. it's it's the curious that are now learning and everyone wants to help each other out. We've we've seen the last year, we've seen the Dutch mining community grow to hundreds of people. And everyone is using their excess of solar and heating their homes and it's happening. And that that's what gives me, in that sense, the shivers that I'm really happy that we got so many people to bring the bank home. And that's where it's all about in the end. You know, we take back responsibility and we will be our own bank. And yeah. that's where we're going. So with regards to mining, what, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of misconceptions. And uh, actually today I, I saw a tweet by, I don't know her name, but she's a pretty famous scientist who actually, she had a video before about how bad mining was. Now she was like, oh, it's way more interesting than I thought. Yeah, it's a German I lady, thought. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She yeah. makes pretty cool YouTube videos. Yes. I, I forgot her name. But then Daniel Batten replied like, oh, you still use old information. Yeah. This is new information, etc." Very cool. So I, I think I, I, li- I like that aspect too because we know me- way more than most established people that have like yeah. a, a certain authority, right. Or, or audience. So I, I love, I love to see that, but I wanted to ask you because you are obviously at the forefront of mining as well. Like what are, what are still the biggest misconceptions you see about Bitcoin mining and how do you, how do you address them? Yeah. People still see it as a waste of electricity, right. Of energy. Uh, it's, mm. uh, but they haven't seen anything yet. And the thing is like, even as I said that I want to take parliament uh, towards a mining location and I want to show them, you know, uh, what we're actually doing. So balancing the grid. So Bitcoin mining is just paying for electricity. We we pay for electricity that we want to consume at a very low, it, it has to be an insanely low price, right? Because otherwise you cannot mine. So it's waste. It's It's electricity that otherwise would have been wasted. So the projects that I'm working on is just, you have a huge factory. They have, the factory is full of solar panels. Most of the time, they cannot put any of the excess electricity back on the grid. Within their factory, they need heat. So we engineer now a heat buffer. We put a mining location there. We push the mining, the heat into a heat buffer. And then throughout the week, when actually the factory is working, we can use this heat into the process. Wow. And then next to that, because you you create a base load, you can basically take full-time electricity from the grid and we just drop the mining when there's excess. 
you know, or sorry, when there's a shortage on the grid. So a couple of hours a day when the grid needs to be balanced, we just drop the electricity from the mining. We, we don't need the heat constantly anyway. And then we actually ensure that this grid stays balanced. And with that, we lower the cost of the grid. So uh, the grid providers would be happy with this. We supply heat and we actually use all this excess. And this is the projects that we're all working on. A lot of these projects are already there with greenhouses, but we don't show them in public. They're huge. Yeah? So they're 10 megawatt plus. They're already running in the Netherlands, but we can't show them because we don't want any pictures or videos anywhere because they will pick a trailer up and you know it's millions of euros. Mm. So risk-wise, it's relatively high. Plus, we don't really yeah, want people on this location you know like we, we don't want to show this but it's there yeah. and i think the politicians need to know that this is there and that's why we need to show it and then again it's proof of work you've seen it you've touched it and that's where we're going and the new projects that are going to come online in the next years across the globe will all be based on this heat and excess and we will have such a positive impact uh, everywhere around the globe. Uh, and with access, I also mean like uh, the methane mit mitigation, the things we already all know. Uh, but it, at some point, it will spread uh, among mainstream. It, it will be seen at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I find it fascinating that people think more energy use in general is bad, which... Um... You know, when they say like, oh, Bitcoin mining uses in this video of this German lady, it's like the equivalent of what Indonesia uses, I think she has as an example. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it, it can be used for something else. I think that's the entire point, right? Like the fact that you say it's waste energy because the incentive for a miner is to find the lowest cost um electric energy that that's not energy that is newly created by a newly bought energy source may yeah maybe at some uh, waterfall in the middle of uh kenya or you know um yeah but this is what know. gridless is doing right yeah exactly I, I, exactly what you see but there, in essence is, it is wasted energy it is because, wasted. yeah because it cannot be harvested yeah um and uh, you know at, at that at that location because it's not economically viable exactly. I, I would add to the list that that you mentioned is also because you mine the bitcoin you do not only uh you know do these things that you said but you make it economically viable right you can actually have more than a 100% return on your investment in in the yeah. in the energy um no but just just look specifically at the sources. Netherlands. every time we have a little bit of wind a little bit of sun we turn off gigawatts of yeah of excess gigawatts yeah. are being turned off mm. and the thing is why is it in the netherlands not being done with bitcoin mining is because everyone that turns off is paid a lot you know, still. And yeah. the thing that we by do... By the energy companies then to do that? or Yeah, it's subsidized. So yeah, you, yeah. you just turn off and you're being compensated. So yeah. in the end, all the Dutch people pay the bill, right? Mm. Everyone pays this bill. Yeah. And then just For not shift... using the windmills and solar farms that have yes. been Yes, and then shift your view okay. towards Texas, where they have yeah. an even more extreme build-out. The build-out we are going to have in the Netherlands very soon but they don't have these incentives. So they have gigawatts and gigawatts of mining there because they want to actually use this electricity and they want a base load that can shut off directly to actually balance the grid. Yeah. So if we wouldn't be in an oversubsidized society here, yeah. we would have had a lot more Bitcoin mining already. Yeah. And this is something that people don't even grasp yet. But yeah. luckily, you know, even because, on the level at Tenet, yeah. even they are getting educated and we will get yeah. there, but yeah. it will take time. Because the, co the government or the, or the, um, the net, um, or the, the company that, that um, takes care of the, of the energy net, right? Yeah. They can earn money instead of paying money, right? Or the government can, can earn money and the people can pay less for their energy, right? I, I talked to Des B. Do you yeah. know him? Yeah, Des B. And he I told met him me, in uh, Madeira. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. He told me, uh, um, I have to say it correctly, of all like the renewable energy sources, only one third of the created energy uh, gets sold. Yeah. But it, it does not get sold. It, it gets sold. You pay, you pay three times as much for what it's actually worth because only one third can actually be used. You know, and it's such a basic business case because if you can sell 100% of the energy, then you pay the regular price as a consumer of of the energy, right? Yeah. You and me, just the sit the citizens, right? And and the person who owns the um, the energy source gets actually paid <laughs> for the energy they they get created and and even more, right? If they mine Bitcoin, because they could sell sell the Bitcoin as yeah. well if it appreciates in price. So you get you can get over a hundred percent return yeah. on on any investment in a renewable energy source, which is just again so so logical right but it goes so much against the current landscape of you know how how it's managed i think that's also what you yeah but that's why, why why bitcoin mining is moving upstream you know closer to where yeah. it, the generation is so yeah. what we will see is also when batteries come into effect okay if we have batteries in in, in, in let's say a more microgrid level you know a small grid where you have a lot of access because you need to have a worst case generation uh, uh, capacity that there will be a lot of access even with the batteries in place and you actually want to fully utilize your entire setup. So you will plug in some mining there because you want this base load that just drops directly yeah, exactly. when you have a shortage. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. shortage is just a small moment in time throughout the year. So there's always capacity for this base load. But that's just on the energy level that people are still not grasping i think and we just keep on searching for the optimal uh, locations and i think now we are still very early so there are still margins on bitcoin mining but i think they will deteriorate in the future uh in bitcoin uh in bitcoin they will but uh, yeah of course in fiat terms it still looks good right so yeah. uh, that's what we are currently discussing i have like a graduation student uh that uh, is looking at it in the built environment so we have a case at an elderly home where instead of changing natural gas for natural gas we would put a small bitcoin mining installation there because it needs high temperature which we can do with bitcoin mining uh, so we would electrify a part of the natural gas and then what what does this look like cost wise and then you just see this curve that he made, like in a low, mid, or a high expectation of the Bitcoin value, but directly exchanging the Bitcoin for fiat. And then mm -hmm. you just see the first years, it's, it's the best solution, it's the best solution. But then after a couple of years, of course, a, a different Slowly solution flattens. is better if yeah. you just keep on selling directly. But then yeah. the question is like, will you sell your Bitcoin for, eh? or will you buy <laughs> euros directly for your Bitcoin? If that's not the case, and you make then an estimate at the point where you do it, where you might need it or you don't, yeah, then it's it's a business case that's extremely solid. But it always comes back to do you believe in Bitcoin? And yeah. like all the installations I have built, and there are quite a few now, it's always this core question. Do you believe in Bitcoin? If you don't believe in Bitcoin at all, don't step in. It's, I, I, I won't even touch the project. Like it's, mm. I'm, I don't want to be near it because yeah. it's not about the fiat denominated value. You need to see a future for Bitcoin. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense at all. And I think that that's often lost, you know, that most people are in this for, for euros, but the people I've, I've been with and that they understand Bitcoin and they know where this is going and that's where they invested in. And that's a lot of families, actually. So, the, and I'm happy to see that because the next generation will only be stronger in this. Yeah, I yeah, love that. Love, love that you're sharing that. I, I personally don't have a lot of insights about, you know, the mining industry. So it's, uh, I, I love that you're sharing that. I think this is again something, you know, like another dimension of Bitcoin that you, that that is a rabbit hole by by itself, you know, and. Uh, yeah, in general, that's just fascinating about Bitcoin that you can have like all these all these different dimensions. But especially the mining part, I'm super interested to see 
where that's going to go. I, I wanted to ask you two more questions because I see it's pretty, it's pretty late. We just, we just started talking. So I, I love, I love that. Um, I wanted to ask you about self custody setups. Like you have so oh, yeah. many wallets and you help people out. Like what are like the most basic recommendations for anyone yeah, who's, so who's building their self We actually self don't have setup. that many wallets. So we made a very strict selection. So the thing was, when we started with the mining, all these families, of course, also needed to store their Bitcoin. So they ask you, okay, how do I store my Bitcoin? And there's a thousand options, as everyone knows. And then the question is, what is the optimal solution for which family? And I think that's different at a different point in time. Uh, and, so, and also different for, for people. So we made a very simple selection. We wanted the code to be open source so we could actually check what is running on the device and preferably also that it's open what's in the device you know so um and that that's the case and uh, what 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 we have now so it's open source fully open source both software and hardware then we have um air gapped so we don't want any physical connection with the internet because the device generates the code eh? and as we were saying eh, on steel or it's physical and we want it not to touch the internet at all in any way. Yeah. So it has to be air gap. That means that there's an air <laughs> air between the connection. So that means that it actually communicates via a camera. So it, it shows a QR and it scans a QR. So it's an air gap device. And then we want it, it to be Bitcoin only because in the past I helped people and at some point they were in some kind of... Uh, coin with a dog and lost all their money so uh, i don't want it to be related to any other coin but next to that it's also an attack factor because if you have other coins in the device uh, it's an additional risk and then only three device three devices were were, were possible so yeah if you look behind me it's, it's a blockstream jade it's a foundation passport that's like the the foundation passport is the most expensive, but the most easy also. And then you have the Blockstream Jade, which is the cheapest, mass-produced, but very great device. And then we have the Seed Signer, which uh, we produce with a, a group of people uh, in the aluminium uh, casing. But you can just build it yourself. So uh, that's an option you have. You can just download the part list. But we assemble it into a proper device because a lot of people want this proper device and it's quite difficult to build it in the aluminium frame. So that's uh, the three options that we currently have. And there's another option going to come, uh, really beautifully made, but that's for later. Um, okay. but, but, but these are the three we currently do. And what we see, we, we sold hundreds and hundreds of, of jades. So uh, it's a mass product, it's cheap. Uh, but we also sold quite a few foundation passports and that's actually where a lot of people uh, are really uh, happy with because it's an easy setup. I, I think that's something that I would advise a lot of people. I don't know if you have any input. I love my foundation passport. Yes. Yeah. I, I think, I think, uh, and I had Zach a ceo on, I don't know which episode number. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Check that out. But I, I love his fish. It, this is the apple of Bitcoin. Yeah, 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 yeah. He has actually also I once had a call with him and he has all these uh, pictures of the commercial of Apple behind him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cool. Uh, and then the seat signer. Yeah, of course, th there are some things there that, that people uh, might find difficult because it's a stateless device. That means that the seat is not kept in the device itself. Mm. And if you don't, properly back up and know what you're doing you don't want to go there you know like you really need to know what you're doing so uh, the first steps in general you know are, are, are either passport or or, or jade uh, not the seed signer so it's more for the bitcoiners uh, in that sense and yeah. then the nice thing is the thing we sold most are actually uh, seed I'll show it one sec the paper. this is this stuff so it's just thick yeah. paper, you know, with seed QRs because you can also put it in a QR code, yeah, the seed, so your your access, and then the words, but on thick paper. And then next to that, we do that 
into a seal bag. Oh, I have them here. So you put it in a seal bag. And that's actually what we explain on the website also. Like, why do you put it in a seal bag? Yeah, you don't want anyone to touch your backup. So whatever backup mm -hmm. you have, if it's on steel or it's on paper, you want it in a, in, in, in a little bag that you can see if someone touched it. Because if someone touched it, even if it's a multi-signature or it has a press phrase, that part is compromised. Yeah. And also the signing device, you put it in a bag because if somebody touched it or found it, you can see it. Eh? And there's a unique number on it. It's super cheap. You know, we sell this shit. It's like 50 cents and we ship it all in, a, in the envelope, you know, like. <laughs> nice, so, nice, But nice. people order this by mouth because they understand that it's, it's, that's the way to, to store or have this additional security on already proper security. And it's super cheap anyway. And yeah. this is something we we came up with with a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, like, oh, this is the cheapest way to do it. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's what I love also about the community because everyone thinks about these things. And mm. what we just discussed, like where, yeah, what what's the best way? It's difficult. Uh, everyone needs a different solution. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thank, thanks for sharing. I, I think... Um... It's a little journey. I think uh, the passport is my fourth wallet or something, you know. Or oh, third. Yeah. I was in the ledger know, rack. So... I was in the ledger rack. That's, oh, yeah. that's what pushed me a little bit extra, you know. If if an address is yeah, known, mm. that that that's really scary, right? So yeah. also with with that's also what I explicitly uh, always say that we delete the data directly after we ship. So for me, because personally, I was, yeah, I, I was in that hack. So that the, the ledger hack that means that people that ordered ledgers during a certain period, yeah, uh, the database, database was leaked. was leaked, yeah. and all the email addresses and home addresses, home addresses of all these people, or shipping, uh, because if you didn't use your home, but home address for most were were on this database, and there was a lot of shit shipped towards these addresses. So physically at this location, it was actually not my home, so <laughs> don't worry, but like the shit was coming in there on my name and then you know, holy shit, something happened. This is not good. Yeah. And wow. that was the ledger hack. And I, I wanted to prevent people from, from yeah seeing this happen. So I don't store any data and uh, it's actually really cumbersome. So if you just go to shipping, you know, I have uh, the, the order, I manually input that, you know, or we mm. do that. I'm not the only one. But <laughs> we manually input that into uh, the shipping uh, part because uh, if you would open an API for the shipping, it's a huge risk. It could be scraped. Uh, it would end up at an account database with the shipper. So we don't have an account with the shipper. So it's not related. You want to keep that separate. And I think yeah. I'm I'm like one of the only ones who does that. But I'm I'm I've I've been in this hack. I, I yeah I took it personal. So <laughs> that's why I'm I'm, well, I'm like this on this. So uh, yeah, nice 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 practice. I um I wanted to ask you the last question. Yeah. I think we can talk for an entire day. Actually, maybe we should do that sometime soon. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the door is yeah. open for you. So yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the last question is, is, is something I ask everyone, uh, uh, I ask the same question and that is, what is a core belief you will never let go? The core belief I will never let go. Be good to others, then they will be good for you. And Bitcoin will help everyone a lot with this. Love that. Well, thanks for sharing and thanks for this conversation. Uh, yeah, we should do this again sometime in the future. And then uh, we just go for, for three hours, I think. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll make sure to uh, to link to your social uh, socials and uh, and to your company so people can check it out. And uh, yeah, man, thanks. Yeah, sorry for, for the long rants. Thank you. <laughs> no, love it. I love it. Thank <laughs> you, man.
I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.